Coming to you from LARB HQ in Silver Lake, Los Angeles, California. I'm Colin Marshall. This is the Los Angeles Review of Books podcast. Today I'm sitting down with three poets. To my right, I have Adam Fitzgerald, who is the founding editor of the poetry journal Maggie, and is also the author of a his first collection and most recent collection, The Late Parade. Then we have Tom Healy, who has I could name a few things. Because always he's described as a man of many talents. But let's, let's say this. He's got, a, he's got a new chapbook out, which is a collaboration with a tattoo artist. And his name is Duke Riley, correct? Which is just the name you want a tattoo artist to have. <laughs> that book is Animal Spirits. He's also, as it happens, the chairman of the Fulbright Foreign Scholarship Board. And to my left, we have Robert Polito, whose latest poetry collection is Hollywood and God. I mean, two subjects... I'm always thinking about, even though I'm not religious, nor in Hollywood, on the streets of Los Angeles. He's also newly appointed, by the way, the president of a certain organization you may have heard of, the Poetry Foundation. Robert, your interests include film criticism, noir, crime novels. Los Angeles is not a totally irrelevant city for you to be in, is it? Not at all. Not mm-hmm. at all. Um, it's, a, it's a city I've been, I've been coming to probably for the last... Uh, um, 25 years, in, in part because my my wife's family lives in Dana Point, which is mm-hmm. about an hour and a half uh, south of here. And it's, and it's a city I've come increasingly to love and a city that I think, like I think probably everyone in the United States, I, I already kind of lived inside before I visited it for the first time. 25 years ago. I mean, through psychologically, the, we're here already. Yeah, psychologically here already through the through the movies, through popular music, mm-hmm. through through popular culture. And when I, you know, when I came to write Hollywood and God, I very much saw it as the intersection of two streets, you know, mm-hmm. Sunset and Gower, Hollywood and Vine, Hollywood and God, you know, it, it was on that on, on that kind of continuum. I love the art scene here and i also just kind of loved the way the 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 city looks um when we were driving over on sunset boulevard today there's a way in which those you know all those buildings that were kind of put up in the 1960s and 70s and really weren't meant to last more than a decade and are still there they look Mm. they look incredibly seedy during the day and then (laughs) when the darkness at night fills them in and and the neon lights come on they you know, they have a glamour to them that's, you know, irresistible in both aspects. What I told Robert that I, I find lovely about those kinds of buildings is the uh, personification they take with the name they have. They're called taxpayers because people who own the property aren't necessarily certain what they want to do long term. But so they put up a small flimsy building that right. they can rent out and it'll pay the taxes. But then those buildings take on personality yeah. mm. as kind of characters in our fantasies of Los Angeles. Before recording, Tom, we mentioned that you mentioned you always enjoy your visits to Los Angeles, but very often they include morgue visits. Why? Well, my sister is a um, police officer here. She's actually a homicide detective. For a long time, she was an undercover gang detective, and she would play the blonde, mole, sexy girlfriend to a uh, undercover cop would be Mexican-American or Korean-American or African-American to play a gang member. And mm-hmm. and uh, so they'd be undercover. Now she's in homicide. So most people are dead before she has mm-hmm. to deal with them. And they often end up in the morgue. And I'm fascinated by the opportunity to go there with her and see the cycle of Los Angeles life. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, have you been to... A New York morgue, a morgue elsewhere, do you think Los Angeles life is discernible in these bodies? I think that life is discernible in its bodies because there are different stories to tell at different times. What Mm -hmm. kinds of crimes happen where? For example, it's much less likely in New York City that someone gets electrocuted uh, by pushing a a shopping cart to pick up – wire that he's going to resell in a junkyard and then take copper wire that's actually live and be fried into a heap. That's not going to happen in in New York. There are more beheadings here in Los Angeles than in uh, New York as well. And Do more, we know why? 
No, I don't know why, but <laughs> still, maybe better left a mystery. There, there is noir to uh, mm. secret, secret Los Angeles still to be written and mm. filmed. Adam, I've read you elsewhere talk about poetry as city or city as poetry, but how well do these schemes apply to a place like Los Angeles? I understand exactly what Robert meant when he said that it's a city that you inevitably feel like you've already lived in, even if you've never visited to it. But I, my experience for me was actually kind of the inverse. I felt I was going to come to this city and knew exa know exactly what it was about. Mm -hmm. um, I had seen movies, I had read books, I had kind of thought about the West Coast as the, the permanent like rival to New York City, which I love so much and I call a home and my family, mm -hmm. uh, both my parents were born in Brooklyn. But when I came here, it, it just delighted me mm -hmm. by its um, inability to make sense and kind of cohere. Um, and yet it's, it's, it's a very continuous city. I mean, everything ends up being off some kind of freeway that tangles together. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think you're referring to, I, I said somewhere that, you know, I was thinking about poetics in terms of city space and how inevitably I feel like my poems are interested in that, the kind of density and intimacy of things that don't belong together that you get in a city, mm. which is, I think, a very New York frame of mind. In incongruity. Yeah, incongruity, but just a certain sense of that, you know, on a certain city block, there's, you know, you could have, I, I don't know, 15,000 people living on that city mm. block or more maybe. Um, but in Los Angeles, there's these infinite gaps, mm. I think, um, even down a certain drive or down a certain alley. And last night we were in Chinatown, uh, again, a part of LA I had never seen or experienced before. Mm. And, you know, it conformed to no sense I would have had of seeing Chinatown in um, Boston or New York or mm. um, Philadelphia. Um, it, it, there was there was a quality to it of a, a stage set. Um, There's a good reason for that, as it was built that way. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and they were. I just filming. finished a Chinatown essay, oh, so really? I, yeah, this is very opportune. Right. But yes, yeah, so you're right. Guess, you're absolutely they right. They turned it into gallery spaces now, and they were filming. I think the Shaws of uh, something, some reality <laughs> yes, TV it show. Yes, was a reality show um, being filmed while we were doing a poetry reading. Yes, yeah. last night you had a reading, and there was they were shooting right there, right there, yeah. 150 yeah. feet away yeah. or so. And you could still buy dumplings down the street and have a beer. It was a perfect stage set. I do like you Chinatown. Know, it, it perhaps will sound glib to say, Adam, but I think your poems are walking poems. There, mm -hmm. There's a density of them, and maybe it's too easily schematic, but it's quite clear that except for destinations, Los Angeles is not a walking city. And so, yeah. for example, you have poems uh, where Naples and Rome and things fit into them equally dense walking cities so and we just think of so much of that peripatetic tradition mm -hmm. in poetry in american poetry whether it was whitman or wallace stevens walking forever in their their poems and we're confronting a different kind of atmosphere for poetry mm. in and and i wonder if one could push this kind of poetic a so driving poetic drive yeah well, that, but it's interesting what you say like like i don't drive and so yes. when, when i come to los angeles by I myself <laughs> I, you, you, either you drive me or my wife drives me or i don't drive either so yeah. good company but i but i always end up having to stay in hollywood or west hollywood which i think are the sections of los angeles where you can actually walk you know walk places but i and i think it's changing a little bit i mean it seems to be turning into more of a bicycle city and more of a, a walking city than it was and the subway is growing and the subway yes. and the subway is growing too but but i remember like you know in the late 90s when i would mm -hmm. come here to do research for something that I was, I, w I was writing and I would be, you know, say walking from the Hollywood Hills Best Western to Book Soup, which is yes. about like, you know, a two mile walk or something like that. People would be looking at me out of their cars, like they're kind of like, you know, where's his shopping cart? You know, I mean, the, it, it, the, there were no other pedestrians on the, mm. the, on the sidewalks. Cart with so, the old wires that you were collecting before and, and, you got yourself electrocuted. Yeah, and, and all he's all lucky. He hasn't been fried yet. <laughs> yeah. Future morgue candidate. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Talked about the incongruity. D is that what you see when you're on, you're riding along on sunset? Is, are you seeing some kind of incongruity here? I'm not, I'm not sure if it's, if it's, if it's incongruity so much as, um, one of the things I like in kind of any city and you and you feel this very much in, in, in Hollywood and West Hollywood is the, is a kind of sense of ghosts and, and what was there before, you know, and when you're driving on, 
on Sunset, you're you're very aware of what was there in the 1960s and the 1970s and the the, the, the clubs that were there. And I'm a big fan of of Edward Ruscha, particularly mm. the the photography books, including you know the you know that 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 great um, you know kind of accordion book he did about about Sunset Strip. And I, I recently saw uh, a, a kind of video where where someone lined up you know all of the images that that he took when he made that book with the places that that yes. are now, in, including you know the the, the Sunset Tower Hotel mm-hmm. where. You know, we're, we're yeah, we're we're, oh, we're staying right now, oh. and um, and, and just and just watching the, the those kind of ghostly transformations all the time, and 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 that's something that you also very much feel in in New York. You feel that you're living in in many tenses and presences at the at the same I mean, moment. And there is something, even though Hollywood and Sunset can be walkable, when you do drive them, it's a slow motion sense so you really feel this uh filmic palimpsest of Mm -hmm. that history that you have robert said that in some ways for many of us ruche created la Mm -hmm. for us it's what frames our imagination of the streetscape and things and then if you think about films that we've watched or literature we have and and our own historical experiences on these streets that then have some of that history and then changing buildings and you'll have a great record store next to, you know, a crate and barrel next to a, an Arby's next to <laughs> massage parlor after massage parlor. The yeah. great thing to me about sunset is that it really feels like ordinary life because there is the laundry place. There is the fast food place. There is the record store, the movie shop, and there are massage parlors and hardware stores. We were just talking about this on the way here. There is a kind of directness. So many streetscapes, think about Latin American cities, where everything is behind the the facade. You have to get inside to that. And here, Los Angeles is right on the street, not like a stoop, but you know what's going to be inside. Right. And that's true of public Los Angeles, like like Sunset Boulevard. Right, it's not Beverly Hills. Yeah, Mm because one of the things that intrigues me about kind of more domestic Los Angeles, the houses, is that you'll have these very nondescript houses and then you go inside and they're they're in fact enormous. And Mm -hmm. then they open up on these large backyards that always contain a pool and none of that is evident at all right. from the you know from the entrance to the to the home or from mm. the from the way that the house looks on the on the street and i think that 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 sense of a kind of los angeles inside los angeles is mm-hmm. is is really interesting and that's somewhat as you've said uh, an element fundamental Mundal element to noir a sense of a secret history, history. Yeah. right adam what is hidden in new york it's it's a different kind of infinitude than L.A. They're both um, overwhelming, but very differently. I mean, one of the ways that you can maybe tie together the sense of city and poetics is talking about spacing, which is, I think, what we're doing. You know, in New York City, you have a poem, I think, that is heavy on uh, enjambment. It's a kind of stickic poem. Um, the the You know, even the skyscrapers look like kind of tall, stickic mm-hmm. um uh, poems that feature very sharp juxtapositions and turns um, uh, with their line breaks and their stanza shifts. But it, again, there's a sense of it kind of space on the page isn't really left open. And so if there are things uh, you're going to catch or discover about New York City, it's usually because um, you're going to go down a, a, a kind of a route that you haven't traveled before and you'll realize there's yet another street or another kind of transition to some kind of neighborhood that I've just never been to before. I remember the first time I was in Tribeca uh, Mm. about two summers ago. I was amazed at how um, vast some of the avenues get as you approach the water. And uh, especially it was in August of the same time right now. And the way that the the light was moving sideways and kind of filling up these kind of um, industrial, former kind of industrial spaces was just it kind of seemed to me like the Kiriko, and it kind of was a mm. large inspiration for the title poem of my book. When I think of Robert's poems, especially in Hollywood and God, I think there is kind of uh, perhaps maybe if I could push the kind of driving poetics versus walking poetics, I think maybe there is more of a closeness to L.A. in the sense that Robert's poems, um, which clearly have a, a formal shape that I think recalls 
um, James Merrill and Frank Bedart, but maybe to push the Bedart connection with Polito, you know, they're very interested in how you can kind of isolate phrases, stanzas or sentences, and then kind of allow for lots of spaces in between. Mm-hmm. Often the voices that Robert takes on in his poems, which you kind of are done with a kind of quiet explosion. So you're never, you're kind of, you're very sure it maybe isn't the Robert Polito you know, but it's it's never done in a kind of ostentatious way or kind of watch me putting on a mask. Mm-hmm. But how are you going to connect these stanzas without a kind of a lot of white space on the page, much like in the way that, you know, William Carlos Williams as a poet um, kind of loves to dance down the page. And um, so I, I think that's kind of interesting how, are the spaces that we live in and and whether they're kind of how open or closed they are, how horizontal or vertical they are, do in some ways, not literally in a total direct correspondence, but they do kind of translate and and reflect onto the page. In Manhattan, if you live in Manhattan, you're, you're always aware, even if it's subliminal, that you're actually living on a very small island. Mm. And that's the first thing I thought of when you were talking about the light. You know, I mean, like yes. the, the, you know... When I, when I live in New York, my, my apartment's way downtown and the, the island is very narrow at that point. And the, and the light at times can be almost Venetian or something because, because yeah. really like, you know, it, it's probably a, a quarter of a mile from one river to the, to the, to the other river at that point. And, and, and I think here, you know, as you were talking, I mean, the, there is something kind of continuous and, and, and this place is about, is about driving. Um, and that you are kind of moving from, you know, from one one block of type, as, as it were, to another block of type with, with a lot of kind of interstitial, you know, material in between. Yeah, just the ocean. Yeah. I'll never forget, David Hockney famously would take friends in, in his convertible who hadn't been to L.A. before and drive around his neighborhood, and he created a mixtape soundtrack that he timed for different parts of, <laughs> of the drive. So you'd get jazz and opera and various things, and there'd be a different kind of music for sitting in traffic versus going up in the hills versus mm-hmm. going down to Venice Beach or something. And he loved creating that soundtrack for, for his film yeah. drive. It, it gets me thinking about... You've got physical space on this drive and you've got cultural space you're moving through musically or even you know, in what you're looking at as the car moves. But do you think much about the intersection of cultural and physical space you know, directly in those words? Well, I've been wondering about it as we've been talking here right. and I feel as if there could be people listening to this and rolling their eyes that we've come up too schematically with the way of defining poetics in terms of space. But I don't think we're totally crazy in this. And what I do think is interest perhaps to us as New Yorkers coming here is that you feel a difference and we're trying to find our way around what's a difference in and how one senses space and things. So even if a good part of what we're – exploring and, and see me as probably BS, it, 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 it's yeah. an attempt to us to define a, a very different kind of experience. Mm-hmm. And, and that's partly what I love so much about Los Angeles is that it's a complex, strange place. And I like just what Robert and Adam have both said. Adam, you, you talked about Los Angeles being continuous. And Robert, you talked about Manhattan in particular feeling like an island and that there are edges you fall off. And there is something to that experience of how you live in a place where uh, you come to an edge and you're in a condensed and fine space or that you drive and it doesn't really stop. And that's very different from the, you know, from the classic edge of the Pacific Ocean about this kind of, you know, manifest destiny and you come to the... I was also thinking too is that I think it's much more frustrating to be trapped in traffic in Los Angeles than it is in New York. Because in, if, you, if you take a taxi in New York, particularly during the day, you're always caught in, in traffic. But, but, but the island is already claustrophobic, whereas I think there's this, uh, there's this illusion here that Los Angeles is supposed to be kind of open and free. And, right. and 20 and, minutes and to ever, I was told. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know. I particularly feel that frustration in L.A. traffic near sunset. Because there's something about the way that the sun setting over the horizon creates 
the depth of space and the urge even more to get somewhere mm-hmm. as that's happening. Mm-hmm. And you feel much more trapped in that circumstance that there is an infinite distance to traverse and you're not doing it. <laughs> yeah. Like, and that's very different from when you're just kind of trapped in a taxi on Third Avenue or right, something like that. Yeah. Fifth. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Adam, tell me about reading poetry here. In terms of a sense of contrast, you know, before I visited California two years ago, I had pretty much made my mind up that I was going to love San Francisco mm-hmm. and dislike LA. Um, San that's, Francisco- that's interesting. You just, what, what, what made you decide that? Oh, uh, well, I think I kind of bought into, um, kind of just sleeping assumptions about, you know, San Francisco is going to be kind of bohemian. It's going to resemble more of New York city. I remember I had a, a one of my teachers in college, you know, who's kind of been to St. Petersburg 37 times and <laughs> famously hates this country that he's lived in all of his life, said, you know, if, if one can't live in New York City, the only other acceptable alternative would be San Francisco. And there is something European about the kind of topography and, and just uh, uh, the Bay Area. But, you know, lo and behold, last summer, uh, two summers ago when I came to visit, um, I was staying in Bernal Heights. I went around the mission, the Castro. I was, you know, going around and I, I, I kind of, I was only there for about three or four days, which is not enough time to judge anything. But you do have these inevitable gut reactions about mm-hmm. whether or not, you know, um, uh, it kind of takes to your nerves or whether you feel implanted in the soil you find yourself. And it felt to me very kind of over curated. And I mean, I don't want to uh, broadcast my condemnation at all for San Francisco, <laughs> hardly the case. And th- even this time, I was in uh, North Beach before I got here. And I, that was kind of a revelation for me because it mm-hmm. is kind of gritty and grubby in an East Village way where I live that I, I responded to. I had kind of thought that LA was going to be, you know, very anti literary or just not even anti literary, just not literary, just mm. that would kind of be a relevant way to think about it. Certain people I know who live here say, well, you know, there's not much sense of uh, a community of readers and, um, you know, literary scenes don't really exist. There's series or different things, but, you know, no one's interested if you're a writer. No one's interested in if you're what your career is. Everyone here is in the entertainment industry. So it's not like in New York where the kind of the exchange that you have to have in meeting people is to immediately identify what you do mm. and what you have achieved or are hoping to achieve. There's so much of a, there's a turbine in New York city that kind mm. of is so much based around, um, I think even more where you've come from or who you're sleeping with the sense of what do you do for a living? Mm. And one of the nice things about LA, um, is that there isn't, to, I don't, have as much a sense of, I don't really know what any of my friends who live in Los Angeles do. Um, they all seem to have kind of, um, they're available during the day if I want to see them during the day and then they're available at night and they all somehow have cars to get around and, uh, you know, they went to graduate school too. I mean, I'm sure they're in, happily employed or doing something, but um, it, it, it seems like it's, it's, it's more about kind of um, what you make of it here. What did you put on that blank canvas? Yeah, what do you put on the blind canvas? And I think in terms of the readers, I mean, we've had three readings in a row. And what was great about it, actually, was that I think, and this is something that's very different from New York. We read in a tattoo parlor in West Hollywood on Wednesday night. We read in a Beverly Hills private home on Thursday night. And last night we read in Chinatown at Mm. Poetic Research Bureau. They were all different audiences, different semiotics of of personality types and just the way people are kind of dressed and orienting themselves towards the audience and they had different ways of responding to poetry being read aloud Mm. um you know i think the tattoo parlor was more intimate because it was a a very small place and most of the people there were personal friends that in a way felt more like a new york city kind of gregarious friends among friends something like that um, Those are not the kind the, of places you might have more readings in New York is a yeah, tattoo parlor yeah, sized you place. Know, New York is a bar scene. Even if you're reading um, not in a bar, you could be reading at a university or you could be reading at, you know, an ice cream parlor or something. There's this sense of, you know, we're all kind of crowded in here together. <laughs> and in New York, you know, there's about, you know, 150 different types of reading series. But even if you meet different people, all of them, they all kind of seem like they're drawn out of the same cloth of audience type in a way. Um, I think they 
appreciate humor and they kind of would like a good sex joke every now and then or something. <laughs> but in L.A., you couldn't necessarily generalize or extrapolate from our trip, oh, well, there is one kind of L.A. reader. Mm. And while I think that might be frustrating for someone, for me, it was kind of exciting because, again, it goes back to my original impression of being in L.A. for 11, 11 days two summers ago. Every day I was in San Francisco, I felt like I knew the city too well. It just kind of it, it kept on re reconfirming what I thought of it the second I got there. San Francisco, forty nine square miles. Los Angeles, four hundred ninety nine yes. square miles. Yes. And every day I was in L.A., I knew it less well. Mm -hmm. I felt like I had I was unknowing my own sense of this city the longer I was here. Mm -hmm. And so the readers maybe have a little bit to that. There isn't a centralized sense of the readership here, at least mm -hmm. to my knowledge. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's exciting. Maybe that means there's a bunch of people who either go to events or don't go to events or have a certain scene or not, but um, they can't be typified. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's, I mean, what do you guys feel about that? What was your, what was either your experience? No, like? I, I felt exactly the same way. It's three very different audiences. I mean, to, to maybe tell an allegorical story about, about this, I mean, in the, in the kinds of improvised wayward things that can happen here. Um, if you're from out of town, is that like last summer, my wife and I and Adam happened to be in Los Angeles at the same time. And, and I knew that Maya Darren had filmed Meshes of the Afternoon on King's Road in 1941. And I thought that we could actually see from our hotel room, the, the house where it was. So we're, we're driving up King's Road and we actually didn't find the house really easily. It looks more or less identical mm -hmm. to the way that it, you know, it, it looked 60 plus years ago. So I asked Adam, oh, you know, pull, you know, pull it up on YouTube. So we're, we're actually watching the movie on exactly the <laughs> spot where it was filmed. And, and at that very moment, you know, a woman comes out of the house and says, oh, can I help you? And, and we explain that we're there because Maya Darren had filmed this movie here and we're watching the, the movie and she, you know, she invited us inside and right. she, you know, and, and we toured the house, and the house again was more or less identical to the Did way. Do you have the sense she does this all the time? Like, no, oh, another no, another meshes no, 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 a crowd. Because, sure. it, because cause what was fascinating about it is that she was in the process of selling the oh. the house, and so that all of, a lot of her own furniture, or most of her own furniture, had been had been moved out of it, and it, and it looked like a kind of stage set to go mm. back to the Chinatown thing. It was all staging. You mm. know, the furniture for the most part wasn't hers, except for there was a photograph of. David Bowie over the <laughs> fireplace. And I said, Oh, is that part of the staging? And she said, No, I was the, I was the costume designer and the man who fell to earth. And oh. then suddenly you're, you're like, like, like you're, you're putting together kind of decades of, of history all in, all in this one spot. And uh, Bowie as Thomas Jerome Newton in the yeah. film. Oh my yeah. God. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. You know, but, but, but inside Maya Darren's home, you know, and kind of where, it's hard to think you know, about directly. to a certain extent, like, like American avant-garde filmmaking was mm. was invented, and so all of that was 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 kind of in play, and and I think in part because I think so much of New York takes place behind kind of closed doors in some ways. I mean, like I I, I think you could probably, if you tried really hard, replicate an experience that would be analogous to that mm. in New York. But but my sense is that you can you can have that all the time here mm -hmm. and then to well, even like strangers are rarely invited into people's homes yes. Yes. in new york from the street <laughs> yeah, yes. yeah i mean I, I think not a good idea happen, yeah <laughs> yeah i mean there must have been we must have given off some signal yeah. that we were kind of trustworthy no or, harm. or maybe potential buyers that, of, the, think, is, uh... of the home <laughs> and then to kind of complicate the story even more we you know we we drove uh, you know a, a, f a few more miles and then suddenly we're we're in front of the the house where David Lynch filmed Lost Highway yes. and lives. And I was hoping it, you get to him. Out. And when we get there, like we go out and we're just kind of you know playing tourist in front of the house, and and we we hear him on the phone from the from the inside the oh the house. You're and not going to mistake that voice. Yeah, you're not going to mistake no. that voice for anything. <laughs> and so you know the, 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 this this all transpired within the space of about forty five minutes. <gasps> I often hear Lynch brought up as a, a creator who captures something about Los Angeles no one else really has. Yeah. Who who else does that? You know, I, I probably come to Los Angeles kind of inevitably through film noir, and, and this is one of the great, you know, the great sites of, 
you know, of, of film noir. And there's, and there's enough of those old buildings and, and architecture left that, that you can sort of, you know, re revisit some of these same places. But, um, you know, Tom mentioned, you know, um, Edward Rocher before, and, uh, you know, he's, he's an artist that, um, you know, increasing, you know, I have increasing admire, admiration and respect for, and, the, and there's a real sense that in those photography books, but also in those, in those paintings, I mean, in this, in the same way that you could say that the America we inhabit was invented by Andy Warhol, mm-hmm. you know, the Los Angeles that we're visiting was, it was either invented by him or, it, or it was some kind of, you know, mysterious, complicated collaboration <laughs> between. <laughs> Undiagrammable. But, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, mm-hmm. and so that when you, you know, when you, when you see these signs uh, or, you know, you, you see signs on Sunset Boulevard or, and whether they're new signs or the Palimpsest of old signs, I mean, they're, they're, they're still like the world of his paintings. Um, I visited the Getty a, a, a couple of months ago and there was a, a, a small Edward Richet photography show next to, uh, a very large show that was about Los Angeles imagining its future over the last hundred yes. years. Mm-hmm. And they were kind of the same show mm-hmm. in some ways. I mean, <laughs> you know, that's, that's, now that I think yeah. about it, you're, you're, you're right. Going from, going from the, these settings, the tattoo parlor to the stately, I mm-hmm. imagine Beverly Hills home. A lot of them are stately there. And ending up at the Chinatown space next to the dumpling hut, your impressions as well of that, Sequence. Well, we ended with some of the best food, with the, mm, <laughs> with yes. the dumplings. As a visitor, as a stranger, all of those places become stage sets. There, none of the three was a place familiar to us, and it just seemed to be a happy coincidence that they had such distinctiveness from one another, and mm. we felt a very open embrace as outsiders come to read. It really did feel like spots on a road trip, which is partly what we've been taking. Uh, Mm. uh, Adam and I were in Seattle and Portland together, and then he was in San Francisco, and some people have come, other poets have come in and out of of this trip. And Mm. so it just felt felicitous that we got to be in a number of different spaces in Los Angeles. Mm. And tell me a bit more about going up and down the West Coast, reading. What what differences jump out at you about what it's – what it's like to be doing poetry in West Coast cities like that. You know, I just, I'm a little hesitant in somewhat where this conversation is going because I feel we're being a little schematic and stereotyping about Los Angeles versus New York. Mm -hmm. You're right. But just impressions. Yes. And what I've been wondering about with this conversation, though, is that I do think there's something fundamental to writers wanting to define a space, even if that's provisional for this interview and in an hour we'll talk about these spaces differently. And something for poets is as obvious as the mapping of your mental imagination to a physical page that I've always thought about writing poems as physical objects. Many of my poems are very short and I think of them as objects that are physically put together and taken apart and often banged over the head with a, with a hammer or something. Not delicately wrought. No, (laughs) not delicately wrought for me. But so it does seem important when you go to a new city as a writer to shape it somehow Mm -hmm. to your own past expectations or even where there's going to be a blankness that you'll be open to having it shaped differently for you, as as Adam was saying, what his expectations of Los Angeles were versus actually getting here. So uh, it's not that I necessarily have clear definitions. I just do think we have a desire. Some of it's narrative and mythic, and some of it is the sense of craft and objecthood of poems that make us want to Look at these things. So in that context, then I feel as if we could all give riffs on Seattle versus Portland versus San Francisco versus here versus New York. And all they are, I think, that's relevant about that to me is that I want to have a physical shape for them for the moment I'm in them. And the same thing is true of meeting up with a friend you haven't seen in a long time, right? You're, 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 you have this space that exists back in time with them and you've got to 
hammer together a new psychological space quickly, don't you? You can't just inhabit the old one. Right. What I do find interesting, too, is that people have an expectation that there really need to be tribal competitions uh, between uh, uh, the uh, residents uh, of different cities. And yeah. what's so comical to me about that is that Americans are the most mobile kinds of citizens ever. It's to me the same as so many sports teams where people get passionate about I, – I have a home in Miami and people are passionate about the heat. Mm. But they're all like the Yankees bought members. I love the heat too, but it's not because they're Miami so they much. As, and, and there's something about city identities this way that's somewhat ludicrous for us yes. to yes, be yes. so certain of what the type of a person is. There's no question that the physics of a city, that the weather, that the kinds of occupations and all the rest of it do – affect us. Yeah. But there are many people from all over who are here, many New Yorkers in yeah. L.A. and uh, mm. people from L.A. in Portland. I actually just saw a website where, and I think it was partly because of Gus Van Sant's commute between Portland and Los Angeles, there's a, a website being created to express the connectedness between Portland and Los Angeles. Mm. And, well, I guess yeah. you could do that between, you know, Portland and Modesto. Or, you know, <laughs> There's or got wherever. to be one. There's got to be one. You know, yeah, but I think one of the one of the backstories I think to this conversation is that for the past two years, um, Tom and Adam and I have been teaching a class at the New School that we're you know that we've called Ash Lab, which is a kind of digital mapping of John Ashbery's house in mm -hmm. terms of his work and his work in terms of the house. So in fact, we're we're actually. Thinking about about spaces and the connection between writers and spaces and, schemas. and, and schemas and and things like that and you know all you know all the time and um, but but I think we're also really wary as, as you were suggesting about kind of generalizing and in, yes. in some ways but I was right. but I was reminded the other day that you know um, Procopius's book Secret History you know his, his secret account of Justinian and Theodora like the like the the, the Greek title of that is Anecdota. Exactly. You know, you know, and I think that's all we're doing here is just kind it's of telling stories. anecdotes or, yeah, or, or, or what you were saying, impressions. Yeah, so you know? I mean, impressions are valuable. I, I try to collect them. You know, I, I can use them wherever I'm going. And I, I love that you brought up the, the ludicrousness of rivalry, Tom, because mm -hmm. I'll bring this back to something Adam said. You, you mentioned thinking about the New York-Los Angeles rivalry, shall we say, or mm. deciding that. In, in the rivalry uh, between San Francisco and Los Angeles, you took for a while San Francisco's side. Those rivalries seem all to be one way. Uh, people here don't hate San Francisco and don't <laughs> hate New York. It's a fascinating type of rivalry. But tell me, what's your interest in rivalry in general? I think I've read you talk about uh, your interest in an era when fistfights could erupt over aesthetic differences. You know, what rivalry interests you how? You're about to see one of them right here. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> um, Front row seats. <laughs> I come from a family of Irish and Italians. Mm. Um, so we both can get our, our blood up easily. <laughs> um, I love a good argument for the sheer sake of the argument. Mm. Um, from which you derive what? Oh, the, the pleasure of blood and sport. No, uh, f from just, I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a way in which when people argue, um, they kind of become changed. It's mm -hmm. like water takes to a boil. And I think some people are, um, you know, my impressions of Robert, a dear friend, is that he's just a very diplomatic person. Mm -hmm. um, he, just. He, and he knows he, he you know he's kind of a wow. cool cucumber i'm you know i'm i'm always trying to poke at people to kind of to to rile them as a sense of affection and you know uh, i can't you know robert's operating at a higher level of of being than i think wow. that, um <laughs> than my kind of bloodedness at least um but in terms of this rivalry you know i harold bloom was one of the first um literary critics that i i read passionately mm -hmm. and um Obviously, his idea of anxiety of influence and the agon, that sense of literature is the Greek contest, which he basically himself steals from Nietzsche talking about the battle between Plato and Homer. Mm -hmm. And it kind of goes back to, you know, as um, Tom was saying, how ludicrous it is to kind of get into these battles between cities and sports teams. But, you know, what's more American in a way? Mm -hmm. What's more American than to have this fictional identity that has nothing to do with blood, mm -hmm. has nothing to do with history, but we kind of, and, and I, I, 
I'm, I'm not necessarily a sports fan, to be honest, but I, I think I like the idea of it in a way. Mm. Um, I don't like the unthinkingness of it or, or if it becomes hostile or violent. I think that's something else that I'm not interested in. But the kind of rhetorical play of it, the idea of trying to generalize, which is always a risk, uh, which I'm kind of, I kind of trample on and want to take mm. it because I like the idea that you could have an impression and somehow that's all you live with are your impressions of things. And so whether you're aware of the generalizing in, in impulse uh, uh, to extrapolate and say, you know, I've left the room and that's what this person is for me. Um, I think we're doing it all the time. I don't think we should forget it's uh, it's not just American where people don't see this, but we are three white men and a white male uh, interlocutor here. <laughs> and so I think that Argument. WMI, they call me. <laughs> Ar argument is male as well. It's a, it's a mm. way of uh, defining, mm. and I, I share with uh, Adam an Irish heritage, and as uh, my partner said, well, the anchor is right in the name. It's Ireland. But there is a way in which yeah. for a certain type of person like ourselves, there is an ecstasy to argument that is a feeling of aesthetic engagement that's heightened because, and you may, I mean, one may, I think it's certainly true for Adam and me, one may not even have that great a stake mm. in the position being argued, which is like high school and college debate that you should mm -hmm. then be able to flip mm. that side and that there then becomes a, a sense of how you could care about something. I would love to argue L.A. side versus New York's and suddenly take Miami's side. Mm. Uh, I don't I'm not so sure I want to take Cleveland's, but, you know, to be able to be in that position of having an imaginative capacity for a different way of thinking and being from what you have. And even just mm. this is what was so great about travel, even if it's just across the country to come yeah. to some readings here to, you know, slip out of our ordinariness mm. and the mundanity of the routines we get in. We forget that we even get in routines yeah. until you step out of them. And wow. and yet we've been really welcomed uh, by yeah. so many kinds of readers here. It feels a little indulgent to have yeah. that yes. fun and that... Uh, and now we get to opinionate and judge and yeah. score them. <laughs> this isn't really rivalry in the sense of argue, arg argumentation um, and, yeah. and fighting, but um, over the last three nights, um, in, instead of the, the three of us or the four of us or last night the seven or eight of us getting up and just reading all of our poems and in, a, in a set, um, we decided to do it as a kind of round mm. robin. And one of the things that was so creative and transformative about it is that we all arrived, I think, with set lists, which we changed based on the poems that the others were reading kind, kind of around us. And it, and it wasn't exactly rivalry, but there was, there, was, there was some sense of, oh, yeah, Tom just read this poem. Let me read something that kind of bounces off of it in some interesting way. Or, or Adam brought up Caravaggio. Let me read my poem that also, you know, mentions Caravaggio. And, you know, and it, and, and it wasn't rivalry in an in a argumentative sense, but it, was, but it was this kind of playful, generative way of, of, of doing more, a reading. That felt more musical to me yeah. mm. over the last, if for everybody who's been in a band mm. and yeah. certainly for people who listen to jazz or yeah. played, that felt more like that to me than the yep. typical reading that has a person read six or eight poems and the audience is either engaged or not. And then there's a pressure question of, will that person read one too many poems? Yeah. Oh. Or four too many poems? Over, you yeah. know, and, and we had something that just opened up and, and, yeah. and became communal here that I liked a lot. Yeah, because I think the flip side of rivalry is, is like medley. Like, I mean, like yes. what, what I felt we were participating in was this kind of medley of voices or something <laughs> like that. And, they, mm. and, and the evening added up to something you know, different and larger than any one of us. And, you know, I think going back to the musical point is important because, you know, when I, I say, I, yes, I, I, I can get in spats like anyone, but what really interests me artistically is not argument in terms of petty squawking or just wasting time or kind of letting the emotion have you rather than you have it. Mm -hmm. It is this sense, I have a poem in my book called The Argument. And um, I, re I was remembering actually that, I think the formation of that title, uh, whether I was aware I was doing it or not, 
would go back to the fact that there's an interview John Ashbery gave that I think I must have read 10 years ago where he talks about um, the word concerto uh, uh, comes from the sense of argument. Mm -hmm. And um, he was saying that, you know, my sense of my own poetry is of uh, a musical piece that has to argue with itself until it's finished. Mm -hmm. And that very often when you listen to music, there is a kind of, uh, a rhythm and a sway and a swing that it will take on if you're able to kind of go with it. How will it resolve until it's um, found every kind of space to uh, riff, vary, and repeat? Um, and th for me, of all the readings we gave, what was most interesting about the Thursday night reading was that I could really feel um, a kind of tone and mood be set by the preceding readers that I felt participating in. Um, you know, I think we started off kind of reading all, in a way, crowd pleaser poems, uh, mm. you know, um, which are very good poems, I I, I would say. Um, you know, Dottie read one of my favorite poems of her, uh, you know, I Like Weird Ass Hippies. And um, Robert, I believe, started with Paris Hilton um, uh, Talks with Jesus. Mm. Um, and so I said, oh, look, we're just going to kind of uh, bandy about and we're going to have a great time. And then in the second round, who's, was Dottie going first? I think so. Because so. she wanted to. The second to. round, it kind of all got contrapuntal. It, it got contrapuntal. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and, and very different, darker you know, tones. Darker, and, and it, it amazed me that um, it's kind of part of what, you know, the, the sitcom formula, you know, or kind of, you know, radio shtick from the 40s or Jewish comedy. You know, you, 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 you want to make people laugh and cry mm -hmm. in a kind of in, in intimate space together. And um, because it kind of excites the premium uh, of each feeling in its contrast. And I think mm -hmm. that's something about reading together and, and not just we're all going to do our separate blocks and tire ourselves out. We're going to kind of... Um, trade spaces and there there wasn't for me at least any rivalry there at all but there was a sense of kind of like uh, writing a collaborative poem almost mm. see that's it, that's interesting i was about to say something very similar about we're talking in some ways about the emotions of that uh, communal spirit but i think adam just talked about concerto and and robert was talking about caravaggio being a riff and i have a, a poem about overhearing lauren call talk with a waiter at the uh, Bel Air uh, hotel pool, mm. and the word there become was Clementine. But so much of what I think is how poems are made is that a word or a phrase, whether overheard, taken, or just something you're tumbling in your head, that becomes either a seed or the the speck around which all sorts of things start to form and grow and confuse. And that happened, I think, in our readings, that yeah. something mm -hmm. caught us from linguistically from what one of the other yeah. readers was doing. And so while, yes, there's that emotional play, why it, why it felt like music to me is when you hear improv and a musician catches a phrase from someone else and pulls it along. Mm -hmm. And there is definitely the intimacy and trust emotionally that they're with it. But that's almost taken for granted. And what happens is that you're listening to something. It's a particular kind of listening. And I, I, we had the chance to do that with one another here. So I guess it just means we're going to be a road show now yeah. across the country. <laughs> I mean, I think like, I think it must be what like jazz musicians mean when they talk about like trading choruses or something yes. like that. Adam, you mentioned Robert doesn't have, it doesn't, does not get into arguments as, as I've heard. Uh, but I'll tell <laughs> Wait I, till you. Wait till you see. Some people could tell, <laughs> tell you otherwise. <laughs> In any case, we'll go with that. <laughs> I, I myself, I find myself constitutionally unable to get into arguments, and sometimes I wish I could summon the it, the imaginative certitude, or ima I could find the ability to imagine my way into temporary certitude that true arguers have. Did you have that envy? At its best, it, it's kind of what Keats meant by empathy. You know, it, it's your ability to kind of disappear into, mm -hmm. you know, into the, somebody else's viewpoint and somebody else's world, and and that's and that's incredibly important to my poems. I mean, my my, my poems are autobiographical often, but in a very deflected way, mm -hmm. and that they're they're a kind of disappearing act that allows me to kind of come back through these through these characters and voices. But I think at its at its worst, it reminds me of you know, something I had no interest in when I was in high school and less as I got older, the, the kind of high school debating 
point of view that uh, yeah. that I now associate with kind of lawyers who can you know argue any position right. convincingly you know and so it, it's on that weird continuum between kind of empathy and you know and sociopathy and yeah and, and, and kind of nihilism <laughs> yes. you know on the on the other side yes. that you know that, that that I think the the art that the three of us do takes place inside out of the argument we make with others rhetoric out of the argument we make with ourselves Tells poetry, poetry. Mm. and we're all very different poets mm. uh, when we were reading with Dottie also a very different poet last night there were seven people reading and I think everyone sounded different and yet something that I think is very particular and pronounced about our time and you can see it in the kind of literary spats and arguments that are happening um, even this week um, in, on the Rumpus and the Boston Review, Calvin Beattie and Amy King um, responding to conceptualism and the different responses that are going back and forth in that. But we are living in a time, I think, where that, that Yeatsian kind of romantic, solitary genius um, uh, mentality, uh, which I, I'm still a sucker for in a way, I, I think that's kind of been, it's being modified and being rewritten. I think we can, out of the argument with others, start to make a poetry um, because it's, it's, it's a way of, uh, I think what Tom was saying, you know, this isn't just the process of how we've been reading lately, but I think it's the process of how we write. Mm. Um, and I think part of what teaching the Ashbury class, I, I know for me at least what it's meant, is realizing that often we can enter into literary studies and think that... Um, Poetry is a closed universe. Mm. Um, and maybe, and I like closed universes too. I, there's something exciting about that. Mm. And, but I think it's, I think it's kind of also, as we know, it's been eclipsed. And I think that the, the part of the new thinking that we, I feel we've been trying to do with this, this Ashbury, uh, class at the new school, um, is to realize that the generative impulse and seeds and threads that run through creating and making poems are so wildly diverse across popular culture, across experience, and they don't have um, uh, a kind of set genesis that maybe we're used to thinking about poetry where, you know, someone kind of has an inspiration for what they want to write about then they go about trying to write it and then they revise it and fix it. That, that, that model that maybe, or that narrative that will maybe we we'll always go back to in a way, um, that doesn't necessarily really relate to my experience, at least mm. of poems. I mean, often I find that my poems begin, uh, and hopefully end by me not knowing what I want to write about. Mm -hmm. And often what I, what the, the steering points that I'll come upon to kind of keep the ship intact will be uh, what I think are either accidental or arbitrary reference points to different TV shows or overheard sayings or... The cultural and physical space, once yeah, again. Yeah, the cultural and physical space, or the things that are around me in the room right now. And mm -hmm. that could be the book that just happens to be open. So, you know... Mm -hmm. um, uh, Tess Taylor's uh, galley is here, and so if I was if I was going to be writing a poem, there would there would be a kind of convenience and luck by whatever would happen to be at the stack at the top of my bed, and I would kind of start poking through it and and kind of maybe riffing off of it. And now maybe you would say, well, that's kind of an insignificant choice. You're just kind of plundering source material and blah 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 blah. But I think part of what we've realized in doing this Ashbury class and. Uh, Robert's idea was that by documenting John's house, maybe we'll come closest to a visual biography mm. of a very elusive poet mm. uh, who prefers that way, who prefers to be elusive and doesn't want to kind of um, bother having the conversation about what he's about or what he's not about or whether poetry should or shouldn't be about something. Mm. So, But I, I think we're learning that these accidents and that these arbitrary gestures can be deeply revealing, much in the way that Robert's saying that his poems that kind of are deflected and oblique can be very autobiographical. One way I see this that, that Adam's talking about and that certainly does happen in our attention, careful attention to John Ashbury's house in Hudson, New York, is if I had to make a definition of poetry now, I think that poetry is about fetish and whatever the source is of that thing that you – are going to obsess over whether it is a style of writing, a kind of material for it, whether it's lyric or not. 
it does depend on, as we're finding in our attention to John Asbury's house, the fetish that this thing matters. Mm -hmm. And you don't need any rationale other than your own compulsion about that. And then you mm -hmm. want to explore it in whatever way it it is. And it would be why I find some of these debates in poetry about who's right and not about where the appropriate kinds of poetics or sources of poetry or uh, aesthetics are, is it you wouldn't argue with someone over the appropriateness of her fetish for one kind of thing or another. You'd want to somehow encourage it as a source of creativity, right? And, and Or it would just be interesting. It would be interesting. To track it. And so track it. And there, that to me seems enough, really. Mm -hmm. Just embody that fetish with some complication and do it well. And do it, I think, honestly, that it really does. I can believe, yeah, that is your fetish to write poems that are only about, uh, tran that are transcripts of Kim Kardashian's text messages or whatever the source may be, Mazel Tov, <laughs> as long as I feel that makes that artist an interesting individual because of that passionate concern. One of the most relevant qualities of a fetish is to the holder of that fetish, it's absolutely necessary. There's no escaping the fetish. It's, you need it. You need to fulfill it. I don't know many artists historically or at present that engage that I don't see their art making as necessary to them. There's no other way around it. There are lots of other better things to do in some ways, more practical <laughs> things, easier, anyway. easier <laughs> to do <laughs> for a happier life, but yeah. there's no way around it. It's it's necessary for you. Yeah, Adam mentioned Frank Bedard before, but I think one of the things that, that Frank has talked about is that like writers don't choose the material that kind of galvanizes yes. them the, mm -hmm. the most. You know, I mean it's 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 given to you in some way out of your your past and your psyche and your your circumstances. And I think that's a little bit kind of what you mean exactly. about it. You know, it, it isn't like, you know, you're, you're uh, a different kind of writer, like maybe an academic, you know, choosing a project like, Oh, this is the project I'm going to work on. You know I mean? It's in for most art, of us. I think it's not art, like that. choosing your subject generally means propaganda. That's why so right. many <laughs> political poems are so bad yeah. because mm. you've chosen what the issue is and then you need to say it. And, and art generally, even portraiture, what's so cool about a real artist doing a portrait is, and I was thinking, we were talking about Ed Ruscha as one of the dominant forces for us in the imagination of Los Angeles. I think his sister spirit is Catherine Opie, and we were even talking about her last night with these wonderful overpass highway series she did. But I also think her extraordinary portraits mm. of uh, people in Los Angeles – the thing that can happen with those portraits is even there, she riffs on something that's surprising. Mm. She'll have a certain regularity to the pose and lighting and other things, but that very form is going to allow an immense serendipity in how the sitter gets to be expressed. And so mm. there's a form she's using of doing this, but she's just – has this compulsive necessity to cataloging all these things that get to express themselves uh, with her as as kind of a medium for that. So it's it's extraordinary to me to see good art happening just out of people's fetishes and compulsions. <laughs> and you know, I would say that I happily and unfortunately agree with what <laughs> Tom has just said because. Um, but I think the counterpoint to all that is that there's nothing sadder or maybe more artless than to simply yield to um, your compulsions as an artist. I, I think that 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 damages ultimately the the that other element or that X element that has to be achieved in trying to make something that's because where skill comes in. that's where skill comes in and technique and and practice and mm -hmm. and I think. It what actually causes, I mean, without trying to get into like German philosophy and, uh, uh, you know, the treatise on the freedom and the will, um, I think what, what really makes improvisation and spontaneity and surprise and the uncanny so important to us is that all of us who are these kind of um, antagonisms of different compulsions and instincts and preferences and biases 
how can we kind of um, go about making the poem today in a way where um, we don't simply yield to who we are before we write that poem? Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, going back to the sense of whether you're walking or driving, I like the space that a poem takes to write and, and to be finished and then even to be read again. I, I, I don't. I want it to have a kind of inevitability of phrasing and craft and music, but I don't want it to have inevitability in terms of, oh, I knew that that was the kind of turn I would make there. Um, of course, that's the phrase. Would, yeah, and and I think that's that's what can sour things so quickly. If if you know if if art just kind of lives up to its expectations that it very easily gives you, and maybe that goes back to what we were talking about, Los Angeles, that it 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 has thwarted my ability to to map it or pin it down or to think that um it can that all of my these are just impressions and they and they're they're provisional um you know ashbury said in an interview that the reason why he loves the music of busoni so much the italian composer who was himself a kind of transcriber and uh, modifier of Bach, mm-hmm. so much so that when uh, his wife was introduced at a party, someone came up to him and said, oh, Mrs. Busoni Bach. Um, <laughs> uh, he loved the fact that when you listen to Busoni's music, it seemed like any line could have been rewritten and replaced with another one. Mm-hmm. The sense that the music had, it could have been done any other way. Not any other style, not any, but that all of the lines in a way kind of had a kind of interchangeable overflow of possibility that's that i think that's that's the uh, a concept that's important that to many artists be a bad way to describe some of your own poems mm-hmm. that they have that overflow of possibility and interchangeable nature and that the beauty comes from the fact that they are trapped in this one mm. and that's the, the thing you hear but that meaning isn't stable and the the musicality of what you've just heard feels so provisional and necessary and not necessary at the same time. I just wanted to bring us back uh, to the morgue because yes, indeed. Perfect. <laughs> if, if, if there is a way to talk about this question of our compulsions and artistic necessities, fetishes, if you will, and where is the space for practice and development and achievement of an art? My sister, the detective, had a case where uh, there was uh, a dominatrix place in one of uh, Robert's mini malls that he talks about that Ruche might have developed. It turned out a little storefront. But it was a place where inside there were various women who were dominatrices and there were many rooms built by very good carpenters and stage designers so that there would be the gynecologist chair. There was the school room. There was the uh, penance. uh, What do you call it for confession? Confessional. The confessional, Mm -hmm. there were various stereotypical scenarios built in. And eventually the owner of this uh, place was killed gruesomely and some of the people in it were burned in a conflagration and their bodies were all at the morgue. But my sister had to talk to many of the people who went there and practiced a whole kind of – art form, sexual art form by being there to find out who might have done this and wanted mm-hmm. to do it. And what one of the things that's not relevant to the who done it of the murder was that she was fascinated by the personality types of people who first of all would have maybe predictably uh conventional lives outside and then would go into this place for pleasure. But that the scriptedness of the roles played, she wanted to look for, if that's so scripted, someone has to break the script to have committed the murder, right? Mm-hmm. Someone has to have been willing to step out the confines of that. And so she said, you know, that murderer had to be the one who's most like an artist because they had to have some sense of what 
the definitions were, the rules were, the satisfactions were, and still a willingness to torch them all and to feel some freedom from them. And she said for the longest time, she thought that was an important insight, the longest time everyone she interviewed fit that category <laughs> because they all went there to live in some kind of conventional rule-based structure and then to find an amplitude of freedom within that, to have some subtle differences in what their role plays and behaviors and style of dress and tones of voice and physical interests in the role play were like. Mm -hmm. And so they – that it took a long time to find the actual culprit because all the participants were murderer artists. Oh, yeah. oh, oh, oh. Well, that's fascinating because in a way that's the great theme of Nabokov too. I mean it's 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 sort of like – you know, was the person who departed from the script a good artist or a bad artist? I mean, so that yes. like you have somebody like Kinbod in Pale Fire, or mm -hmm. Humbert Humbert in The Leader, that the what those books are about in part is is the dangers of aestheticization. Like you, you start aestheticizing parts of life that exactly. that shouldn't be, whether it's it a, a young girl or right. you know. Or, well, and we never said Los Angeles wasn't dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no one has ever said that. I don't think I've been speaking here at LARB HQ in Silver Lake, Los Angeles, California, with three poets today, Adam Fitzgerald, Tom Healy, and Robert Polito. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you. Colin. Thanks so much. This has been the Los Angeles Review of Books podcast. I've been Colin Marshall. Find more from me at colinmarshall.org and more from the LARB at lareviewofbooks.org. Thanks. Thanks.